This week on the Red Sneaker Writers Podcast. Have courage. You need to be brave to be a writer. You need to never give up. Welcome to the Red Sneaker Writers Podcast. News, interviews, and writing tips for people who are serious about having a writing career and want some practical knowledge to help them achieve it. Your host is the nationally best-selling author of more than 50 books, William Bernhardt. Hello, Red Sneaker Writers. Lace up those red running shoes because we've got a terrific episode for you. These are happy days for the book world. Well, I... I I mean, this is a happy day for everybody, isn't it? If nothing else, you should be celebrating the fact that today is April 15th, and nonetheless, you did not have to file your taxes today. <laughs> Just enjoy your stimulus check and worry about taxes later. As usual, I'm joined by my sound engineer, Jesse Ulrich. Jesse, how you doing? I'm doing well. I actually did pay my taxes yesterday just because... Just because? I, I, well, I had the money, and I was, I was going to spend it if I didn't give it to the government <laughs> as I owed them. So I figured I might as well do that now. I'm sure so. they appreciate the early money. They do. Now, am I right? You, you've got both vaccination shots now, right? Yes. You are... I, I think it's today's Thursday. Yeah, so I'm, I'm now officially past my two weeks of my second shot. So I am. Oh, I'm, well, I feel safer just talking to you. And, it, it, and we're, feels, what, 100 miles great. away? Yeah, it, it feels great. <laughs> so It does. My interview guest for this episode is Jacqueline Machard, the New York Times bestselling author of many beautiful books, including, of course, The Deep End of the Ocean, which, among other claims to fame, was the first ever choice of Oprah's book club. It's got a more recent sequel, No Time to Wave Goodbye. Her most recent book is Two of By Sea, and she's written many, many others. Two of By Sea, Kirkus Reviews described it saying, a troubled protagonist is beset by magic. Isn't that wonderful? She's also written young adult work, and she is a renowned writing instructor. And I can't wait to get her on and pump her for information about writing and how she writes. But first, the news. Uh, I have a surprise for you, Bill. And here, oh, yeah? Here's the surprise. Okay, now that was cool. <laughs> I thought you liked that. Was, that. I feel like I'm on Dateline or something. Wow. All right, first news story. This just broke Tuesday, just a couple days ago, as we're recording this. Amazon has announced the launch of something called Kindle Vela. That's V-E-L-L-A, which is going to be a new online Amazon platform for serialized storytelling. Now, those of you like me with long memories might be thinking, hey, hasn't Amazon tried this before? And indeed they have, and it didn't really fly, but... They're giving it another shot with, I think, some new wrinkles. Basically, this this new Vela platform looks to me like it's going to be a mashup of Wattpad and KDP, Kindle Direct Press, what they're already doing with self-published authors. So the idea is that you can self-publish your work, but in installments and get paid by readers. This is going to launch in about three months. It's initially limited to the U.S. market and probably designed for people reading on mobile devices like their phones. So you may be wondering, Red Sneaker writers, I hope you're wondering, well, that sounds like it might be fun, but how exactly do authors get paid? And the answer to that is it is not entirely clear yet. But here's what we know for sure. The idea is that Readers can read the first three installments for free, and then after that, they have to start paying. How do they pay? With tokens. Not money, tokens, although I'm sure you use money to buy the tokens. It's like Dave and Buster's. You just get tokens. And how many tokens do you need to read the rest of it? Apparently, that's going to be based on word count. 
Amazon has said that authors will get 50% of what readers spend on tokens on their work. But beyond that, it's all a little bit vague. You can see the graphic Jesse has put up on the screen. You see the the book and the description and all of the uh, tokens. Click here to buy tokens and you get so many more words. It's all a little sketchy. I don't mean that in the sense of it doesn't sound right. We just don't have all the details yet. And you're not going to hear me recommending it until we do have get all the uh, have all the details but I wanted to make you aware of it some of you may be thinking well could this be an opportunity for new writers aspiring writers people trying to build an audience to start getting their work out and capturing an audience at a relatively low price or token amount as the case might be maybe so but having read What Amazon has put out about Vela, my impression is more that they're going after established writers, like people who have an audience but wouldn't go near Wattpad or Tapas uh, because they think it appeals to a younger audience or because they actually want to get paid for their work. I think they're looking for people with a more established authorship maybe or readership people who are already self-publishing on kdp or maybe people have deals with traditional publishing but want some kind of side project project and see if this might be a way to build more readers through serialized storytelling i mean it sounds fun but whether it's really viable or not I think remains to be seen i don't know jesse what do you think would you read a book in installments like this I mean, I would. I, I like the idea of like returning back to the time when you, you know, authors were paid by the word and would release their <laughs> stories and chapters and like the paper. Um, my question is, like, am I getting the book early by doing this? And uh, yeah, you know, I think the answer to that is yes. Uh, after you've done the serialized version, you can publish it as a novel. Although Amazon is saying that once you decide you want to publish it as a novel, you've got to take it off Vela. It can't be in two places. It's one or the other. But you're right. I I mean, this is a return to the old days in more ways than one. In the 19th century, of course, most novels by Dickens and Collins and the big names were published first in magazines. And it's even into the 20th century, pulp writers, Edgar Rice Burroughs, always wanted magazine serialization to build interest before they published books. So Maybe this will turn out to be something interesting. We'll wait and see. All right. Story number two. This is one that actually has been out for a while, but I didn't want to talk about it until I knew it was actually going to happen. And now it appears it is. HarperCollins is buying Houghton Mifflin, but just the trade division. That is the division that uh, deals with books like you would see in the bookstore, things for a general audience. They're retaining their educational market, textbooks and whatnot, which apparently is the most profitable part of the company, but releasing basically their backlist. And they have a pretty darn good backlist with titles like, oh, I don't know, The Lord of the Rings. (laughs) You might have heard of that one. Uh, HarperCollins, of course, is owned by News Corp which is owned by Rupert Murdoch and his family. So the same people who control Fox News will now be controlling Houghton Mifflin. Now, Houghton Houghton is not considered one of the so-called Big Five, which, as you know, if you listen to the podcast regularly, is about to become the Big Four. But it is nonetheless a significant company, and this is a major purchase. So once again, we're seeing the consolidation of the big boys, the big publishers, the so-called euphemistically called New York publishers are shrinking as they all consolidate, I think, trying to create, trying to gain enough market share that they can compete with that very well-known online bookseller whose name begins with an A. Okay, third news story. This is on social media. Last time you recall, we talked about TikTok and how Against all odds, TikTok has become a major force in book promotion. People on hashtag BookTok giving book reviews that apparently really sell books. Now Barnes & Noble is dedicating entire uh, floor displays, you know, uh, for books that have been recommended on TikTok. Uh, I was on the board of ITW, International Thriller Writers, a while back, and ITW commissioned a study to look into social media, which platform is the best for promoting books. 
And the question was Facebook, Facebook by far. But some time has passed now, and the social media world may be changing. If you can see the chart that Jesse has put up on the screen, you'll see that there is one social media platform which has more Americans participating than any other, and it's not Facebook, it's YouTube, the video-based platform. Apparently, according to this bit of research from Pew Research, 81% of all Americans go to YouTube, at least occasionally, whereas a mere 69%, that's more than two-thirds of the population, go to Facebook. Now, I think Facebook may still be more valuable when you want to be able to talk about your book with a few more words than you're allowed on, say, Twitter, which has a puny, what is that, 21%, I think. But YouTube can apparently really capture a broader market. Of course, that means you have to have some kind of video platform, like, say, this this live stream video podcast we're doing right now, or the book trailers that my son Ralph and many others make as a way of drawing attention to their books. Jesse, you are... I think somewhat younger than me. What social media do you use most? So I I use Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter and Reddit. If I had to like list them, I wouldn't count YouTube as a, I would count YouTube in a separate category because YouTube is like, Mm -hmm. like, yes, you can engage with people, but it's not, it's much more passive than sort of the Facebook or Twitter engagement. Um, well, and people like, don't chat back and forth, right? Yeah. I mean, listen, like you want to waste some time, like read the YouTube <laughs> comments on a video you're watching. Like it's a terrible idea. Um, <laughs> Except if you're commenting on our, yes, on our yes. podcast. That's Sorry, great. But right. Okay. A harder question. Has YouTube ever inspired you to buy anything? No. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> great. Right. Keep this in mind when you're deciding uh, where you're going to go to market your books because the social media world appears to be changing. Three quick cuts, and then I'm going to bring on our interview guest. First, Clubhouse. Remember that audio chat platform I talked about on the last pat, plat, on the last podcast? Now they're allowing app users to send payments directly to creators. So apparently not only can you talk about books, people can just send you money like it's Venmo or something. Second, Pro Writing Aid, which is an online engine for editing your work, is hosting Crime Writers Week. And that's next week. It's online. It's free. And they have a terrific lineup of guests who are going to be speaking. Authors like Karen Slaughter, Lisa Gardner, Steve Berry, who was on this podcast just a few weeks ago. If you're interested in crime fi- crime fighting, crime writing, then I I don't think you could possibly uh, do wrong by checking out this free online seminar. Last story: There's a new social recommendation app out there, and it's called Likewise. L i k e w i s e. It's a way of recommending things you like that gives stories, things like movies, TVs, and, of course, books. Why am I mentioning this, this Yelp for story addicts? I don't know if it's going to take take off, but I know this. Right now, you can register and reserve your name, and that's what you need to do, Red Sneaker Writers. Go on and reserve at William underline Bernhardt or whatever your name is. Don't make the mistake many people you made when websites were just taking off and they didn't reserve the URL and pretty soon to get their own name dot com they had to pay thousands of dollars to somebody who'd reserve the name first. Go on likewise and do that right now. I wonder if Jacqueline Machard has gone on likewise and reserved her name yet. I'm thinking maybe she's too cool for that. But, Jesse, why don't we bring her on and we'll ask her, all right? Hey, Jackie, how are you doing? Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Hi, hi, Jill. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm not at all cool. (laughs) But that does sound really cool. Which which social media, if any, do you engage in regularly? Really? Social media. Mm, right. 
that you Can't should really to. be. Nope, you should really be uh, bringing uh, bringing stories that have nothing to do with you to your readership. You know, on Twitter, uh, bringing stories uh, to Facebook and and Instagram and uh, and some of those other ones that younger people use photos when you're on a book tour and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my colleagues, lots of my friends said, Oh, you know, I wouldn't do that for, for money. And actually that's, that's absolutely what you do do it for is for mm-hmm. money because people, that's where people find your books. Lots now I heard you say like just about 10 minutes before we started the podcast that, that, that you're somewhat on the, the shy side. In fact, you said that you considered me gregarious. And I thought if I'm gregarious, you're like a recluse or something by comparison. I'm so do you shy. enjoy? So- I'm just reclusive. I, uh, I don't know what to do around people. You know, I, I'm a writer. That's what I do. I, I tell mm-hmm. Uh, I'm a clerk typist for society. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not engaged in it overtly. I just take mm-hmm. notes. Whereas you, Bill Bernhardt, I expect someday to tune in and see this is Bill Bernhardt and his tigers. I mean, you do <laughs> everything. I mean, there is nothing that now it's Bill Bernhardt and the news. You know, it's it, it's you you boggle the imagination and you have like you know, 30 children. And, you know, it's, it's amazing. To me. <laughs> you know, those tiger zoos are pretty popular in Oklahoma, but yes, that's a yes. whole different I know subject. what I'm talking about. Okay. So if you're reclusive, then I've got to ask, I mentioned at the intro, you're probably at this point tired of hearing about the fact that you were the first ever selection of the Oprah book club. Now, what was that? If I ever get tired of that, yeah. I, I, if I ever disdain to talk about that, I will, I'll slap my own yeah. face because that was such a great masterstroke of generosity and good luck in my life. Sure, it set me on, uh, it set me on a trajectory um, toward being able to write more stories and having permission to do that. Um, and it was a ton of fun mm. and there was no downside, but you were on the show, right? That's gotta be hard for reclusive, uh, Jackie national I television. That. You what? I overcame and I overcame that. And uh, also the hair and makeup people. Mm-hmm. There is no one like Oprah Winfrey's hair and makeup people. Really? You are trans formed into the vision that you want to see of yourself your hair is like it is right well probably not you but me (laughs) Um, right before you go to bed at night your hair is finally exactly the way you want it so you can get into bed and just read um but uh i've actually been on oprah winfrey shows probably four times in in different contexts and Mm -hmm. every time was great fun well, wow, you're you're right. I've never been been on Oprah, but I was on Jeopardy, and uh, their makeup people basically took one look at me and said, "Nah, there's nothing we can do." Oh, Just go. You were on Jeopardy. Yeah, I, I forgot was. about that. See what I mean? Bill Bernard <laughs> and his tigers. Of course, Oprah was not uh, the beginning nor the end for Deep into the Ocean. It was also made into a major film, which is a lot of writers. Well. well after the dream of being on uh, an Oprah book club selection, the next dream is to see a film made from one of their books. What was that like? Oh, that was also a delight. Everybody was just, they were very, the, the book was very, the movie was very faithful to the book. The production was really classy. Um, Michelle Pfeiffer was a doll and really um, sweet and, and kind and generous to me. And I actually have had, uh, two of my books made into movies, one of which will never be probably be released in the United States because of a vendor dispute. You know what a vendor dispute really? is? Really? Um, yeah. I could guess. I'm not vendor, sure. Uh, is in some kind of litigation. And those kinds of things, there are bodies I've learned. There are bodies all over the runway of films that you know, we'll never see the light of day because of litigation that has nothing to do with the film or the book. 
which was the book that was adapted, but I haven't seen it. Um, it called Still Summer. It's about women who are uh, four friends who are on a yacht trip um, and run into the worst kind of trouble that you can run into in the Bahamas, which is pirates. Um, that sounds bad. It, <laughs> there's nothing good about it. There are no, <laughs> nope, it was not Jack Sparrow. It was, there was no right. outside. outside of Disney, nope. no good parents, no. pirates. <laughs> Some good parrots, but no good pirates. Right, right, absolutely. Well, wow. so that's been seen overseas, but not in America. It's not even been seen overseas yet, but will be oh. soon. So okay. maybe I'll be able to get the, I don't know, the Thai edition or something like that. <laughs> um, anyway, but, ne- but but never on Netflix. No, nope, huh? no. Nope. Um, and how many? What? Go ahead. How many books now? How many novels have you written? Counting the one that is coming out at the end of 2021, which has just been uh, dusted and it's done and dusted, uh, 23 books. Not like Bill Bernhardt and his tigers, but but for the likes of me. What's the title of that book? The one that's coming out soon. It's called The Good Son. And um, knowing that, knowing how we showbiz folk are, that's kind of ironic, this one. Uh, ah, well, clearly, we need to get you back on the podcast at the end of the year when that one comes out. That would out. be fun. That would be fun. <laughs> okay. Some people have accused you of writing, quote, sad stories. Uh, do you agree with this or what, what's your take on that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, people always say to me, you're a funny person. Why don't you write lighthearted um, stories? But to me, the, I, I believe as, uh, as Kurt Vonnegut famously said that what you do is you take these perfectly nice people and just mess them up and and have their lives be terrible and cause them every kind of problem that you can possibly cause them and then give them only one small chance to get out. You know, one way to save themselves. And it's a tortuous kind of way that they would mm-hmm. be able to do that. If To me, if there's not some kind of... Unless you're a comic genius... Uh, if there's not some kind of gruesome peril, I'm not even going to mm-hmm. bother. I mean, I to write it or to read it because I have to be, I have to be rooting for the characters. I have to be afraid for the characters. I have to want to walk into the book and take, uh, put matters right myself. Right. So those are the kind of books I like, and you're supposed to write the books you want to read, right? That, that's good advice. You know, I don't really think of your books as sad, though. There's there's heartbreak, but there's also uplift. I mean, I never uh, have put one down and thought, well, that was a miserable experience. I don't <laughs> Yeah, right. But, oh, what a downer that was. You always... To, to me, you always have to be able to leave leave a story right. with some kind of hope. Maybe it's not a true happy ending where, like in Shakespeare, where everybody marries someone and everyone takes off their masks and everything. Um, but there has to be some kind of hope that things will get better. Right. And And what I tell my students all the time is that when you write a story, you have to remember that for the reader, The end of your book is the beginning of their life without your book, right? So they have to be able to walk away from the experience of Mm -hmm. reading your story with some kind of, uh, I don't know, some kind of subconscious idea of those characters going on in a parallel dimension. And that their hmm. uh, their their lives. Have I want to say so that you uh, feel because I didn't say this earlier, but I can see a lot there, of people are watching another, this stream um, live. Setting, if you would like to ask Jacqueline a question, put it in the chat box, and we'll get to that a little bit later. 
But until we get to that, I have a traditional first question that I didn't think to ask first, so I'll <laughs> stick it in the middle here. Uh, if you had one piece of advice, just one, I know you could give a dozen, but if there were one piece of advice you were going to give a writer or an aspiring writer, somebody who wants to write, what would it be? Have courage. Hmm. You need to be brave to be a writer. You need to never give up and you need to have, be able to accept. I was uh, watching. You need to be brave to be a writer. You need to never Singer, give up yeah. and you need to have, be able to accept. I was uh, watching uh, an interview the other night with uh, James Taylor, you know, the great singer songwriter. And he was saying, in order to be a creative artist, you have to accept hardship. You have to do the things that you don't like to do. You have to be away from your family in order to create. You have to be able to um, to be able to bear loneliness and <laughs> deprivation. Uh, again, students of mine say to me, "I don't know how I'm going to do this because I have my I am am in two book clubs and I." You know, I make my own grapes right. uh, or my own wine. And, you know, I have all these things that I do. How do you find the time to write? And I say, you have to go away and be alone and give all those things up. Right. In order to be serious about writing, you have to be brave about giving up your comforts. So that's what I would say. There's a lot of truth. I mean, it's not even just fun things. I can, uh, you know when you're supposed to be writing, doing the laundry seems really appealing. <laughs> because, oh, very attractive. Yeah. Yes. Those <laughs> Much windows less. Windows to be washed. Yeah, right. Speaking of things you do in your spare time, when I was getting ready to do this interview today and reading up on you a little bit, I found out that you and I have something else in common in addition to scribbling all the time and, and torturing our fictional characters. I think we both are big fans of board games. Am I right about that? Oh, I love them. I mean, the knockoff Jeopardy uh, is, <laughs> is my life. It's my very life. And I am, you remember Calvin and Hobbes, the comic yeah, strip? Yeah, got the whole collected set right over there. The, 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 um, the tiger would carry the blanket around all the time and try to get people to play with it. That's how I am with the Jeopardy game. I'm carrying it around and trying to get people to play with me. Really? But no one will play Jeopardy with me, Bill. I'm sure that no because one you will play Jeopardy them. with you either. <laughs> Actually, I suck at Scrabble. I am the world's worst Scrabble. That player. surprises me. Horrifying. I Three letter words, me. Okay, T, T E A. Okay, got it. Um, but I am unparalleled at uh, general knowledge games, and and as a result, I can't. You know, I have to. I have to go to other time zones and other zip codes to find suckers to play with. <laughs> so I want you on my Trivial Pursuit team, is what you're saying. You do want me on your Trivial Pursuit team. Yeah. <laughs> what is this Pocket Jeopardy? Is this like the board game version? No, or what is this an the app? Box around. That's oh. <laughs> trying to get a game, you know, like um, kind of like the, uh, the, the, you know, Jackie Gleason or Paul Newman of, of board games uh, trying to get a, a, you know, going from pool hall to pool hall to try to get a game. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about writing for a minute. <laughs> I indulge myself. So let's get back to the actual. We're at 23 books, I think you said. Where do the ideas for these come from? Mostly the newspaper. Yeah. Mostly because, and and you wouldn't recognize the idea uh from the newspaper as it finally emerges after it's been right. cooked and whipped through the food processor and turned into one of my stories but the inspiration is often something i read online or i hear about with uh with some few exceptions there are some books that are that i've written in which the story was entirely generated 
by something that happened real life in real life. And I just took it down and, and mm-hmm. wrote it, but, um, but mostly, yeah, mostly things I hear about. Um, and I am, and I'm sure you are too. I have some gifts in my life more than writing eavesdropping. That is ah, not, now that's oh, useful. That is my gift. I, um, I just, I can, I consider myself so gifted that I can monitor and write down the conversation, not just at the next table in the restaurant, but two tables away. And some of the stuff that I, they hear, you know, people believe that they're alone mm-hmm. in the world. They believe that they're conversating and uh, they're, and that they're, uh, they're completely enclosed by a bubble, which is a boon to uh, we showbiz folk who are always collecting right. uh, and putting together our next story. Maybe paying more attention to the restaurant table behind you that's having a more animated conversation than the one you're sitting Absolutely at, right? Absolutely true. My dinner companion is is mm-hmm. is always on the the unlucky end of this one time I was in a restaurant in New York and I'll say this very briefly. It was a dilly Uh, at the next table. There was this little couple and I say little, and I mean what I'm talking about. Neither one of them, the man or the woman Mm -hmm. was over five feet tall and they were dressed like gorgeous. Like they had just walked off a plane from Milan and beautiful clothes. They must've been, had a combined age of about 165. I mean, they were, they were two little old people and you could tell that they knew each other forever. She was, you know, telling him, you know, how he would like his gravy on the meat and things like that. And then she said something to, he said something to her and she slammed her cutlery down on the table and said to him, leaned over and said to him, don't you dare say that. I have always honored your marriage. Hmm. Yikes, huh? Wow. They've been having that argument for 50 years, right? And, and did that oh, find its gotcha. way into one of your books? Yeah. I've found there are times when I'll be writing a scene and remember a conversation I had maybe like 10 years before that I didn't even think was all that significant at the time. And yet for some reason it pops into that because it's exactly the right thing for this scene. And so it goes. That's absolutely true. And again, as Truman Capote said, you know, we are always eavesdropping on our friends and our family. And when his, his beautiful friends in on park abandoned him, he said, I'm a writer. What did they think I was doing? Yeah, right. <laughs> Good point. But probably yeah, not probably one that not. gave him much comfort. So you've got a bunch of books and decades of writing. How do you think your writing has changed over the course of many years? Many years. Many that years, sounds years. Uh, so, um, so, it's, the, it's several the years. <laughs> better in the last two years because, I, yes, and here's why. I really? used to have an agent who was one of the best agents mm-hmm. in the business and I adored her and she adored me. And that was the problem. And uh, I would finish my books and everybody would say that swell mm-hmm. and they would publish them. And then I got a new agent after my agent retired. And this agent has, has set the bar for my writing so high that it has made a far, mm-hmm. far, far better craftsman out of me than I was before. Then I got a new editor at the Mira Harper Collins, which is my uh, now publisher. She also is extraordinarily demanding. So I've had to up my game and think of strategies and have that horrible, when you get your editorial letter and it's 10 pages and it's single spaced and you get into your bed and hope that God will have mercy and take you during the night so that everyone will remember your book just the way it was. (laughs) And then you get up in the morning and you creep out to the kitchen and start to do what needs to be done on that revision. I felt as though I would not survive this one, as though I would have bruises on me forever, like CSI or something like that. But um, but markedly in the last couple of years better. And I'm trying to hold myself to that standard, even in thinking of ideas. 
trying to make them much mm -hmm. more focused and much more particular mm -hmm. and have much more, you know, when my, again, when I have, uh, I teach uh, professional writers or, or beginning writers and they, I say, what are you writing about? And they're, well, I'm writing about this girl who moves to New York. And, and then does a dragon eater? No. <laughs> um, okay. What, I mean, does she, does she have a brain transplant? Mm -hmm. um, there, everything has to be, every story has to have intricacies never dreamed of when the person first conceives of it. Don't you agree with that, Bill? No. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you're, you know, you write, those thriller books that mm. are mathematical in there. Uh, <laughs> Nobody's what they part. seem to be. Yeah. No, yeah. no. Everyone in that, as my, my dear, beloved pal, Karen Slaughter says, everyone in a story has a secret. Every single person. Mm -hmm. You and she are good friends, I think. So she's my, you can pass pal. along to her that I think Karen Slaughter writes the best first chapters in the whole business. Uh, so what you were basically saying before was, uh, you know, what people on this podcast have heard me say, and people have probably heard you say it too. Every writer needs feedback, whether it's a good editor or a beta reader or somebody you listen to, somebody you actually won't just say, ah, eh, no, they're wrong, but will actually listen to. That's invaluable. It is. And I have a great friend. Uh, actually, we're writing a book together. We're writing a book together. Um, it's it's called Can You Talk? A Conversation in Essays Between Two Writers. Mm -hmm. And this will be published in about a year and a half. Anne Garvin is a women's fiction writer who writes hysterical books about friends who go on the road and they have a giant Great Dane in the car and they get into all kinds of uh, mayhem and funny things. We could not be more different in terms of our personalities, except for the fact that in real life, I'm funny and lighthearted and Anne is dark, but she writes mm -hmm. funny things and I write dark things. When mm. I'm ready to write, to start the idea for a book, the first thing I do is tell her the story. I, right. I, we talk on the phone or, or we Skype with each other and I tell her the story and I can see when her interest flags and I can see, and then she'll say, you know, I just didn't buy that part. I didn't think she would uh. do that. You have to find a better reason uh -huh. for her to do that. And then I go back to the drawing board and I find before this is before I ever write anything down. And if you can, I think, uh, submit your story to that kind of scrutiny from someone you trust, you'll end up with a better story. That's fantastic advice. Jackie, we got a question here from Karen Bullock, who I know to be a fabulous award-winning writer. And she wants to know, what type of research did you do for the deep side of the ocean? Deep end of the ocean. Deep end of the ocean, yeah. excuse yes. me. Uh, the deep end of the ocean was loosely based on the a case that of a kidnapping that took place when I was in college, though I didn't write about this until, gosh, you know, until 10 years anyway, 10, 15 years after I was out of college. And it was a very famous kidnapping in which the child was, uh, his name was uh, Stephen Stainer. It's a very famous case. And he was out there in Oklahoma. I believe, and hmm. was kidnapped and then returned to his family. Seven years later, he was uh, kidnapped by a pedophile who um, who raised him kind of as a uh, an object of his abuse and kind of as a son. And when the guy took another little boy, a six-year-old, that was when Stephen Stainer was 14, he walked out and he took that little boy with him. And the story could not be more tragic. I mean, he went back to his family and there was all this readjustment for him. And then he finally was making it in his life. And he was killed in a motorcycle accident when he was only 24. But I thought about what would happen if you lost your child? What would be, 
and then the child returned to you, but it wasn't the same person. Hmm. I mean, because you never mm-hmm. are after you right. after you've been not after in that. a situation like that. You're not the same person. You may look the same, but uh, mm-hmm. I just thought it would be an interesting idea. So mo- mainly, I wrote about uh, the psychological realities of people undergoing transformative experiences as adolescents and as children. And so that was sort of all the research I did. And then Mm -hmm. my first husband's family, my husband, I was widowed when I was in my thirties and my first husband's family had been this big Italian family in the restaurant business. Right. And so that's what the Mm -hmm. family in Cappadora's in the deep end of the ocean was, were, were, and that was sort of a way to feel close to him after he died very young. So, hmm. We've got another question from somebody watching. Sharon Jenkins wants to know, what do you think the future looks like for women authors? I think, you know, it looks better and better. I think that hmm. women authors have gotten to the point where they just are not going to t- take a back seat to the big, the big sort of the, you know, and I love Jim Patterson. He's a swell fella. He's a doll, you know, he's a doll of a guy and he does everything Mm -hmm. for everybody in the world, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. But there, people just aren't going to take a backseat to those sort of big box, the targets, the target version of authors like Jim Patterson and, and things like that. They're pushing their way, into the front row and are not going to be denied anymore. So I, and, or dismissed anymore. Years ago, I live on Cape Cod and that's, don't get any ideas. I mean, you know, I, there, there, there are lower end parts of Cape Cod too. I don't live next door to the Kennedy compound though. Who would want to? Oh my goodness. Anyway. um, So I live on Cape Cod. And one time I went to a book signing a fellow was doing a book signing called Sebastian Younger wrote a little book called the perfect storm. And he's my neighbor. He went down the road right. from me. Oh. And I went up there with my little sister and I asked him to sign my book. And, and he said, what do you do? You know, and he didn't care, but I said, I'm a writer too. And, um, and he said, what do you write? romances and um and my sister sort of punched me in the back and said see him and raise him one I mean she said that to the back of my head um, <laughs> and I did and you can and um I I I just really think that um women writers will not be categorized anymore and here's a wonderful organization by the way mm-hmm. Sharon Tall Poppies mm-hmm. uh is a is a is a organization that you can join of women writers who do an enormous amount uh, promoting each other's novels. And there mu- there's probably 60 or 70 women writers in that group, which was founded by my friend, Ann Garvin. And they, and they do an enormous amount to get the names of women novelists out there. Fantastic. Someone else is asking, have you declined to write a story because it might offend someone? Not ever. (laughs) That's what I thought you were going to say. No, 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 (laughs) no. My feeling is if they did it and I know about it, oh, well, you know, I mean, the way to avoid me writing about it was not to have done it. Right. And um, I, I never want to write. Uh, there's an adverse kind of to that question. And, and it's, have I ever written a story that was intended to expose or punish anyone? Not ever either. You know, I right. want to write stories that tell the truth about things that I find um, shocking, compelling, interesting, heartbreaking, uh, miraculous. And uh, people say to me all the time, I can't write this story until after my great uncle dies or something like that. And, and that I find that when writers say that it's just another form of fear, you know, Mm -hmm. fear. I mean, we're so afraid to take, to write anything. I mean, we're the abyss, it's the abyss and we're so afraid to do it anyway, that we'll take our fear wherever we can find it. Even if it's worried that great uncle Harold is going to be offended by this and I say, 
please do not exaggerate your own importance. Great Uncle Harold will never read this book. <laughs> if he does, what he's going to say is, was she stupid? Did she not know there was never a Mr. Chicken on the corner of Grand Avenue in Harlem? Um, that's what he's going to notice. Not that it was all about him and his affair with the parish priest or whatever. Right, right. Jackie, we're reaching the end of this, but before we do, would you talk a little bit about Merit Press? Oh, my beloved defunct uh, young adult, literary young adult press mm -hmm. was under the aegis of Simon and & Schuster, and it went under a couple of years ago because of some of those consolidations that you talked about right. when the, the amoeba when the publishers play amoeba tag and they suck up another, yet another. Oh, I like that. Amoeba tab. Oh, I like tag. That. <laughs> you know, they suck up another one, but I had a wonderful time doing that. And mm -hmm. also believe that for you writers out there who write young adult fiction, it is where some of the most devastating, the riskiest, the uh, most eloquent fiction that's being written is is being written for teenagers right now. So don't mm -hmm. tell that. That was a short. young adult. Yeah. So you think you might ever get into editing or publishing again at some point? Right now, I'm pretty selfish. I I do private editing, and I do that to shape the novels of people who come to me and want to know how they can get their stories ready for publication. And I kind of like doing things behind the scenes right now. The only thing that mm -hmm. I really want to do uh, that is out there is, uh, is to write my own novels and promote them. I, uh, I, right. I you know, I, I just don't have your energy. Bill. <laughs> I, mm, well, I like to yeah, write too, yeah. <laughs> but you can't write all 18 hours no, I can't. each day. So. I, <laughs> really? <laughs> no, not every, uh, when I go to a writer's colony or writer's residence like Yaddo or the Ragdale Foundation or something, I have very strict rules for myself. I write from probably nine in the morning till three in the afternoon. The rest of the day is just for watching mm -hmm. reruns of Criminal Minds. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, Speaking of Merit Press, where'd that name come from? I have a little girl named that. My my daughter, who's 21 and uh, graduating college the next month. Um, my daughter, my wonderful, beautiful, inspiring daughter, who was um, raised in abject poverty uh, when she was a little girl in Ethiopia and came to the United States when she was very young spoke no English, five words of English, and now is a scholar graduating from Amherst with a degree in legal studies and African-American studies. It, she is just um, a shining example of, mm -hmm. of trans, the transformative power of words. You were giving me grief a little bit earlier, but you have nine children. Am I right but about I that? Nine? Yep. <laughs> That's right. You can say that now. Yes, it's impossible. Yes, um, and still manage to write. Yes. They are very tolerant of me. Well, they're not babies anymore. My, my, my youngest kid is 15 now, and my oldest kid is 34. And so this was a store that opened really early and did not close at a reasonable hour, let's say. Mm, um, right. But uh, they're very tolerant of me. They're respectful of my need to work. And as many children, you know, this in big families, children in big families tend to be independent and supportive of each other. They help each other out when they're not like on the war path, they help each other out in uh, some pretty material ways. Well, this has been a complete pleasure. I need to get you back out to the conference I to writer con. To come. And I'll play Jeopardy with you when Will you come. You? Okay. So bring the box. We're going to film that, okay? Laura's oh, going to film it for us, good. right? We're going to have <laughs> the, the, it's going to be like the end of the century Jeopardy off between you and I me. I like that. Yep. Jackie, thanks so much for You're being on the well. podcast. Thank you for having me, Bill. You bet.
I've got just a few parting words before we wrap this up. I mentioned last time that I'm doing these talks with context learning on various topics relating to books and literature. Next Sunday, meaning this forthcoming Sunday, I'm doing one on courtroom drama right up my alley. And that'll be on Sunday at two o'clock central time and if you're interested please go visit contextlearning.com and you can sign up for that i also wanted to say a word about summer writing retreats like jackie was just talking about i host one every summer in eureka springs arkansas at the writer's colony at dairy uh, dairy hollow which is the most beautiful place on earth to write the rooms are all designed for writers it's just a spectacular experience. I look forward to it every year. This year, it's July 7th through 11th. It's five days of intensive focus on your work. I read your work every night. I edit it. we we'll come back next day ready to talk about it. You'll get feedback from me and others, that kind of valuable feedback. Jackie and I were also talking about, and we'll talk about various writing topics and have a lot of fun. I'm mentioning it now because it's already half full. Of course, it's a small group retreat by design because I want to have a small enough group that I can give everyone individual attention and editing. But if that would interest you, please go visit my website, williambernhardt.com. Click on the Red Sneaker Writers link. There's a link right there that Jesse just put in the chat box. And think about coming out to the Writers Retreat this summer. Our next guest on the next episode of this Red Sneaker podcast, Hold On to Your Hats, will be Lisa Scottolini. Legal thrillers, women's fiction, and now she has just published a beautiful work of historical fiction called Eternal. I started it two nights ago, and it's just fabulous. The schedule will be a little different. That'll be almost two weeks from today, but we're going to record that one on Wednesday at 5 p.m. Central Time rather than Thursday. I'll post about it on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and any place else I can think of to post about it. I've known Lisa for many years and I'm really looking forward to talking to her on the podcast. Until next time, Red Sneaker writers, keep writing. And remember, you cannot fail if you refuse to quit. See you next time. Mm -hmm.